Yeah, sure. So we may start now, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, um, my name is Juan, and I'll be giving you uh, uh, today's second lecture after Michael's introduction. So um, I'm very happy to be here. My name is uh, Juan uh, Bruna, and I'm a professor at uh, NYU, New York University. So today we are going to be spending a, a few minutes uh, talking about some basic principles of learning, in particular, all the considerations that emerge as one learns in high dimensions. And please, uh, uh, as I guess Michael also um, reminded, if there's any question or something, just uh, feel free to interrupt and also try to be, I'll try to check a campus wire afterwards. Okay, so uh, the outline of the lecture today, we are gonna uh, discuss uh, three stories, three, three, three uh, snippets of uh, high dimensional learning. The first one is um, I, I wanted to give you kind of the few basic elements. So just so that we can agree in notation and the concepts on the basic, basic notions of statistical learning. Uh, then we are going to describe some of the phenomena that is particularly adversarial that emerges in these problems as one uh, looks at this, uh, the input space has become more and more high dimension. And then we are going <clears> to <throat> try to see a possible outcome, uh, a possible way out in the third part of the lecture, where we are going to try to address the curves. And, and this is really going to be the, a good backdrop for the, the next of the class, right? Where we're going to really be insisting on this like possible way out. Okay, so um, I'm not sure you you had in this master series a, 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 a dedicated class on statistical learning. I probably yes, but here uh, I will just want to try to keep things pretty high level and give you kind of what what I think are in a nutshell. If I had to summarize it in one slide, what are the main ingredients of statistical learning? Like uh, like uh, understood as the the task of extracting information from possibly high dimensional and noisy data, there's basically four main ingredients. The first one is the data distribution. Uh, the next the thing that we need is some kind of model to extract, like to, to process information, right? So this typical model can be, a, you know, like a linear regression. It could be like your neural network. It could be a kernel machine. That's the model. Then we have some way to compare, to, org to classify, choose good models from bad models. That's the error metric. And then of course we need an algorithm, right? We need a, so, some procedure that we can implement on a computer to actually find this estimator, right? So these are the, 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 the first, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the main ingredients in, in, this, in this task. So what is the distribution? And, and I guess here, um, again, uh, uh, you probably have th thought about this question quite a lot. So data distribution, uh, in the case of supervised learning that um, we're gonna be mo mostly focusing this lecture, contains uh, two sorts of inputs, right? The, the XI that we're gonna call the input to the algorithm and YI that can be, can be the function that we wanna predict, right? The label, for example. And so here we are gonna assume that the labels have no noise, right? So, so the label YI, you can always assume that it's some unknown function. Uh, it's like, I, I promise you that there's some F star, which is some function that is hidden somewhere that is producing the labels. And so now we have really two ingredients in the data, right? So the first ingredient is what we, uh, the data distribution in which we draw the example, right? So this is drawn from distribution nu that is defined over a high dimensional space. And then F star is the target, right? The, the thing that produces the labels. Just to things, think, give things a bit more concretely, uh, for example, uh, F star could be, uh, if you are working in a problem in chemistry, uh, it could be the, the excitation energy of a certain molecule X. Or if you are thinking about a binary classification problem, that could be, uh, you know, like the conditional probability of certain class given the input. And so, um, as you know also, uh, these assumptions in the data and having to make these models in the data is really essential, right? It's really like the first step of any kind of uh, uh, analysis of what happens in machine learning, because as you know, there's no free lines, right? The, uh, if there's no assumption on the data uh, coming either from the new distribution or the target, there's no way there's no way we can actually generalize, right? So, so um, this is really uh, something that uh, is at the core of anything that we do, in particular, also of what we do in, in this in this context of geometric deep learning. 
And as I said before, please uh, interrupt me or uh, feel free to ask any question, even if it's like a notation question or whatever. Okay, the second ingredient is the model. And so the model uh, has also can be, uh, you know, there's many synonymous to the model. Uh, you can maybe have heard it like hypothesis class or the function approximation, if you are thinking more in the context of reinforcement learning. So this is really just a subset of functions, right? So it's like mappings that go from the input space capital X to the target space that here I'm simplifying it uh, just to that we are just predicting uh, real numbers. Okay, and so just to, to give some examples of what this thing could be, I mean, you can think about hypothesis classes that are, I would say, you know, old style uh, polynomials, for example, of degree K could be like a, you know, pretty nice, uh, cute uh, hypothesis space, but you, of course, you can make these uh, hypothesis classes a bit more uh, fancy by may maybe maybe trying to model functions, mappings that involve neural networks, like the this cute example that I'm showing here in the bottom. And so uh, what we are going to be using uh, this lecture, and it's also something that that uh, might not be always explicit when you uh, when you run your algorithms, but it's certainly always there, is this notion that there's a, a complexity measure. A complexity measure is always going to be there, right? And so what, what is a complexity measure? Is think it as a, as a norm or like a, some quantity that you can evaluate in your hypothesis that uh, it's meant to organize, to try to uh, divide your hypothesis in, into those that are simple and those that are complicated. And just to give examples of what this complexity measure could be in different situations, for example, if, uh, if the, the complexity measure could be how many neurons I have in my neural network. So smaller neurons might uh, capture hypotheses that are simpler than uh, networks that require many, many neurons. Or if you are thinking about problems that are a bit more uh, connected with, uh, let's say, harmonic analysis, the, another valid notion of complexity is this quantity that you, that you see here, which uh, is, if you have never seen it, uh, this is called the Sobolev norm for a corresponding, for a certain uh, index of derivatives, right? So here, what this, uh, the, the, um, the, what this quantity would be telling you is that if this quantity is very small, it means that my function is simple. And what this, what this simple mean in this context of Sobolev spaces, it means that the function is very, very, very smooth, right? If I have a function that has many ripples and many complicated things, I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay a price. And here, in that case, is this norm is going to be low. So obviously, uh, the algorithm, the learner, will try to find hypotheses that have small complexity. And we are going to see why in just a second. The third ingredient is the error metric, right? And what is the error metric? Again, this is a, I'm hoping that I'm just saying things that are uh, quite familiar with, for, to everyone. So uh, how do I construct the metric? Uh, given, some, I, I, given some initial notion of comparing errors, like the quality of my output, for example, I could think about a, a loss that uh, is just a square, me, me, measuring the square distance, right? So if you are thinking about like predicting an energy is uh, how far I am from the ground truth, right? So, and you can measure how far you are from the ground truth by looking, for example, at the, at the, at the average square distance. And so once I have this uh, point-wise measure, which means it's a measure that I can evaluate at every point uh, for every possible output, I can now consider the average, right? The average. And, and there's two fundamental notions of average in machine learning that are, that are intricately connected, right? The first notion of average is what we call the population average, right? And what is the population average? is the expectation for the data of this point-wise measure, right? So it's how well am I gonna do on average with respect to this data distribution. And then there's another notion of average that is the empirical average, right? Which is the, the in a sense, this, the training loss, right? So it's like the, it's replacing the, the expectation over the data with the empirical expectation. And so obviously the, all the headaches of machine learning, they emerge because we are trying to solve, we are trying to make the population error small, but we cannot use the population error, we have to use the empirical error, right? And so uh, how far, and you might, be, uh, you might be interested in asking how related, right? How, how, do they, how do these two notions of average relate to each other? So the first thing that one, that you can, uh, that one can do, of course, is that uh, if, I, if I fixed the hypothesis, right? If I fixed the function f here, 
if I look at this at this quantity with f fixed, well, this is just a, an, an average of IAD quantities, right? So everyone, every, every one of these XIs is, a, is distributed IAD from the distribution mu. So by just the basic uh, elementary probability statistics, we know that the, the expectation of the population, or the, the expectation, so this quantity here, right? This quantity is a random quantity, right? It depends on the training, on the draw of the training set. So if I compute the expectation, this quantity has the same expectation as this object here, which is deterministic. So it's, an, it's called an unbiased estimator. And the variance is something that I can compute point-wise, right? It's just the, the variance of a random variable that is just obtained by composing uh, this quantity, f of xi, right? Uh, uh, sending the, expect, the random variable xi through the function f, right? So if f is fixed, this object is something that can be explicitly computed, right? The variance has the, this traditional dependent that you know from basic statistics, right? Because just I'm averaging IAD objects. The problem is that this notion of, uh, of fluctuation, right? This, this relationship between the training and the, and, the, and the testing error, I cannot make it point once. Why? Because uh, I cannot afford the luxury of fixing my hypothesis to be fixed, right? So like the, the function f is a function that I will, be, I will be using the training set to find a better one, right? So this notion of uh, how the, the training and the test relate to each other, I cannot make it point-wise. I need to do something instead that is called a uniform, right? So I would like to have a, a, certif a certificate, some kind of guarantee that these two functions, right? If I look at these uh, objects here, not as a random variable and an expectation, but just function, like a random function an expectation of a random function, these, these two objects as, as, as functions, they should be close to each other. And this is something that uh, requires a bit more, um, a bit more than elementary statistics. It requires actually empirical process theory. And you might, be, you might have heard about rather micro complexity. It's, 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 it's one possible way to actually control these two functions in a way that is valid for machine learning. Okay, so this is the, for the loss. Uh, and now we have the fourth, the last ingredient, which is uh, the algorithm. And so, uh, the again, uh, in terms of algorithms here, we are going to stick with uh, very, very simple basic objects. So we are going to describe uh, empirical risk minimization, which I'm assuming uh, uh, you have heard before. Uh, I hope that you have uh, heard it before. So, uh, and I repeat, what is the goal of machine learning, at least in the supervised sense, is to minimize this function, which is deterministic, with only access to this random function, which is a hopefully not too bad um, estimator of the population loss. And so, as I said before, we need to, we need to be able to have a control of the fluctuation. We need, to, we need to control the distance between these two functions in a way that it has to go beyond the point-wise control. So Predict is actually useful to uh, consider, instead of the, our whole, the whole space of our hypothesis that we call this capital F before, now we are going to consider not all the hypotheses, but only those that have complexity that is not too large. So visually, you can, you can really visualize this as I have a space of all possible you know, functions that I can implement from, you know, if you are using a neural net, for example. So you have all the space of all possible functions that I can express with a neural net. And I'm only going to study for now, focus on those that I can express with small complexity, right? And this is the delta here. Think of, think it as a kind of, some kind of radius, some kind of norm, right? Maximum norm that you can afford. So once I have this uh, set of uh, small hypotheses, like a hypothesis that have small complexity, now I can, I can uh, consider an algorithm, an estimator, that is uh, called the empirical risk minimization. And I'm just considering, I'm just here using the kind of the simple, uh, in the simple form, which is what's called a constraint form. Okay, so here, what, is, what, does it, what does it mean? It means that in that set, I'm gonna be uh, picking a function here that can be, uh, can write it as like this f hat delta. Right, which is a function that is in that ball that happens to minimize the empirical risk. So if you have experience a little bit in uh, optimization, 
you might uh, be a little bit frowning uh, when I present an, a constraint optimization, well, an optimization problem in constraint form, right? Because it's a, you know, this constraint, even though uh, in many cases, this is a constraint that is convex, right? So this is a convex constraint. It might not be super natural, super easy to use in practice. So that's why in, in maybe you have, might have seen in other texts, in other, in other uh, expositions, that instead of using the constraint form, we can also consider the penalized form. Right, which is a like you introduce a Lagrangian multiplier where the constraint now becomes part of the optimization objective, right? And so now we have a hyperparameter here, lambda, that of course uh, uh, controls indirectly the strength of the regularization, right? So this uh, thing about this lambda, this delta, and this lambda as being a dual variables, right? And then yet another uh, form. Uh, in which we can actually do learning empirical risk minimization that is maybe a bit uh, popularized uh, recently by very large neural networks. It's what's called an interpolation form. So what is interpolation form? It's a very natural estimator, right? So I'm gonna find a hypothesis. And what is this hypothesis wanna do? So because I have, if I have, if you think about that, I have a hypothesis space, like functions that are very expressive. Right, very, very, I, I can have many, 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 many functions I can choose from. So I can even afford to find functions that completely fit the data, right? So having an empirical risk that is zero, what does it mean? It means that, so, so empirical risk zero, right? Think of, let's think about like least squares. This is equivalent to saying that uh, for all i, my, my function, is equal to the target, right? This is equivalent to saying that your L2 error empirically is zero. So I can find amongst all the functions, all the hypotheses that pass through the data, I'm gonna choose the one that has smallest complexity. And these, if you, if you try to do that, uh, you know, to a serious statistician, he might uh, be like completely, uh, you know, he, he might be a little bit hor horrorized because in general, this, is, this assumption is actually, this is something that you can do only if I promise you that there's no noise in the data, right? Like the label that we observe here have no noise, right? And that's sometimes the luxury that we can make in certain data sets, like in ImageNet or, you know, CIFAR, et cetera. Sometimes we just trust the data completely. In real life, that's not something that you would like to do, right? If you are working in, you know, problems in computational science, it's very rare that you can completely trust the label, right? But but if you if you have the luxury to do that, then you can consider these inter these these estimators. Okay, and so now we have uh, the four. Um, I spent a little bit of time trying to describe these uh, four main actors in the in the um, uh, in supervised learning. Now let's try to see if together we can uh, use them, combine them to, um, uh, you know, to, to say something meaningful about uh, uh, any guarantee of learning. And this is actually something that, um, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple exercise, but I'm hoping that uh, at this point um, uh, we can try, still try to derive all of it together. Okay, so Here's how we start. We start from an, an arbitrary hypothesis, a hat, that is in some space, like in, in some ball uh, uh, in my hypothesis space and has certain complexity delta. And now what we are trying to do is we are gonna try to give you like a guarantee, right? We are gonna try to say, okay, you have chosen this hypothesis. What can you tell me in terms of how well is it gonna do in the test set, right? So what is the risk? What is the population error? That this hypothesis is going to incur. So that's the that's the risk the, that that's the population error of your hypothesis. The first thing I do is that I subtract the baseline, right? And what is and this baseline, uh, just to try to write it to you, it's the infimum over all the hypotheses of the population, right? So in other words, this term that is in yellow is the best you could possibly do a posteriori, right? So if you had some oracle that would give you as many samples as you want, and you could have like infinite uh, computational resources. You could have selected your, the best hypothesis in your class after the fact, that would give you this error. Okay, 
So let's try to look at this difference. And, and this, uh, this kind of like a decomposition of errors, uh, the, the trick here is always the same, is that you have something that you want to control and, and you want to, and the way to, to, to actually uh, make progress is always the same is to add and subtract the, the, the appropriate quantity, right? So we need to take this difference and we need to break it, like we need to transform it into multiple differences, right? So that we can start interpreting things. So any ideas uh, of uh, which term you would you like to add and subtract here? I'm just uh, opening the floor for possible suggestions. Otherwise I'll just uh, move on that uh, if someone wants to, to pitch in. Okay. Well, I'll move on. I hope that I hope that people are following. I know I have no way to actually check. Um, uh, I, I think adding the, the interim wave of delta. Okay. Yeah, delta has to be pre has to be here. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. Indeed. So the first thing we do is that we take this difference and we add and subtract the best we can do by restricting the complexity, right? So now we have a new term that appears here, which is this one that is subtracting, and then we add it again, okay? And now we have a, one object that we can start to interpret, right? So this object here, what is it telling us? What is this object here? It's a difference between the error, if I look at, if I minimize it over the full class, F, minus the error that I get, if I only look at the complexities of size delta. So here you can see that there's a, this term has no data at all, right? There's no nothing, there's no empirical, there's no hats, right? It's a purely, it's a pure term that, that is completely connected with what we call approximation, right? So this is really a term that is gonna be, of course, if Delta is very, very, very large, this term is gonna get smaller. So this is actually what we call an approximation error problem. Now let's continue. Now we are gonna, uh, introduce the training, right? We need to introduce the empirical objective here. And so how are we gonna introduce the empirical objective? We are gonna not only add and subtract the infimum over, of the test error over this ball, we are gonna add and subtract the infimum of the training error in this ball. Okay, so that's this new term that you see here, right? It's here subtracted and here it's added. And I am also gonna, I'm gonna add and subtract the empirical uh, test, like the empirical, uh, like the training error, right? So here we have this training error that appears and here it's subtract, right? So I, I'm not cheating, I'm just adding, I'm, sub, I'm adding and subtracting terms. Okay, so now we can start to interpret again. Can someone tell me what is this green term capture? What does this green term tell us? It's the empirical, it's the training error of my hypothesis minus the best training error in my ball. So if I'm able to solve the empirical risk minimization problem, how much, what is this term? How, long, how much does this term uh, cost if I'm able to solve the, the empirical risk minimization perfectly? Okay, so this term is going to be zero, right? Because the uh, precisely, I mean, this, if this estimator that I pick here arbitrary is in fact the solution of the ERM, that's precisely the definition of ERM, right? So this term, think about, think about it as an optimization error term, right? It's like the, if I'm good at optimizing things, this green term is going to be small. Now I'm left with two terms here that really smell, that really look like something that compares, that relates the population objective with the training objective, right? So here you have a pointwise difference between R of F hat minus F R hat of F hat. And here you have a lot also like a difference of minimizes of the loss functions. So it's not, it's actually uh, not hard to see that these two terms, we can pack them together, right? We can, uh, we can upper bound these two terms by basically the, the two times the largest, the two times the largest fluctuation between the training and the test over my ball. Okay, and then and 
one of these two terms, right? One of the two comes directly from this term and the other one comes from this term, okay? And you can actually very easily see that if I have two functions, right? And I want to minimize, like the difference between this minimizer and this minimizer, I can always upper bound this difference, right? The difference here is I can always upper bound it by this difference, right? Just because this, this point is, is, minima, is smaller than this point, right? And this is also like a point-wise difference. Right, so I have two times the, point, the maximum point-wise difference. And now we are basically done because we have uh, expressed our uh, error, our test error, as a, uh, the error that we make at test time is actually a contribution of three different sources of error. Uh, the first one is what we call the optimization error, right? It's measuring our ability to solve this, uh, this empirical risk minimization efficiently. The second one is the statistical error, which is, some, is a term that penalizes uniform fluctuations over the ball between the true function, which is the test function, and the random function, which is the training error. And then the approximation error, which is the, the term that again controls how well we can actually approximate the target function f star with small complexity. Right? I think that I was actually just uh, giving you the summary here in that slide. And just also let me mention, right, that uh, there's one term that here we put in yellow that you know it's not very important because uh, here, like uh, if you consider like a uh, hypothesis spaces that are very, very, very large, for example, neural networks, the best you can possibly do, right? Like uh, uh, if, uh, so basically this is just that, that if, if, the, if the hypothesis space is dense, then it means that the infimum from F equal from F of the distance between F star minus F, this is zero, right? So this is again, is uh, equivalent to this property here, right? Is that this is actually equivalent to saying that this hypothesis space is dense. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and just as a, as a wrap up, so actually uh, the thing that we need, if we wanna be able to learn in, in higher dimensions, right? Uh, well, is that we need to be good at these three errors at the same time. So uh, we need to have a small approximation error. And this is something that we need to be, uh, try to exploit as much as we can, the hypothesis, like the prior information we have on the target function. Uh, we need to actually consider uh, hypothesis spaces where we can actually control these fluctuations uniformly, right? And this, again, is a, is a, is a very beautiful and, and deep uh, topic aspect of statistical learning theory that uh, really tries to, to, to control this bound, for example, with, as I said, with Rademacher complexities, etc. And then we also need the optimization error, right? So we need to be able to, to solve these optimization problems efficiently. Okay? And so, of course, the, the million dollar question is uh, how can you control these sources of error at the same time uh, when the problem, like when the data lives in a high dimensional space? Okay, now it's a good time for me to ask questions because uh, we can, uh, it's a good time to, to, to stop and ask questions. I, I'm not seeing the chat. Let me see if I can look at the chat. Okay, I don't see any question there. Okay, so I will move on if there's no more questions. Okay, so now we are gonna try to, to, to describe how, you know, how some of these questions look or, you know, transform themselves as one goes into more and more high dimension. And, and, and you might have heard this term of the curse of dimensionality. That was actually for Hi. the, hello? No. I could hear some kind of echo, but I don't know. I don't hear you now. Okay, I'll post the question in the chat. Okay. 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 So uh, the course of dimensionality was uh, first uh, coined by Richard Bellman in the context of actually dynamic programming and optimization, and has ever since become um, almost like a synonymous of uh, statistical high dimensional statistics and uh, in particular Hello, learning. Uh, do I have Hello, a... yes? yeah, I can read out the request question. 
She's asking for the empirical risk. Do we um, always need to have a convex constraint? Uh, good question. Uh, for the analysis that I'm making here, the, the, yeah, the hypothesis space that I'm considering is always going to be um, a hypothesis space that is going to be convex. And think about like uh, uh, in the context of neural networks, this means really considering the ensemble, let's say like the convex hold of all possible neural networks that you can make. And, and this uh, is synonymous to thinking about neural networks, having the last layer to be very, very wide, right? As wide as you can. In the context when you are, you are not, uh, your hypothesis space is not uh, convex, then, uh, I mean, any of the, many of the things that I'm describing here are still very, very, very they can still be uh, defined and, 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 and these different flavors of empirical rhythm limitation are the same. And the philosophy is still the same, right? That the, if you are able to minimize the empirical rhythm limitation, then you can query this decomposition of that, right? The decomposition of error does not require convexity. It's, it's something that is used for convenience so that you can actually uh, discuss optimality and, and global, global optimality in particular. But that's, a, that's an important question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, course of dimensionality. So what is the course of dimensionality and why do we care? So we care because uh, the, the, basically the, the basic principle of learning is really grounded in interpolation, right? If you, if you see now this, my, my screen, you're gonna see a, a bunch of dots, uh, maybe two different colors. And I guess everyone here could try to infer what is the right structure, right? That might be, uh, you know, corresponding to let's say class one and class two, right? Maybe you think about something that does something like this, right? And I guess that everyone, okay, maybe the, you know, the sketch would not be exact for all of us, but we would all pretty much be agreeing that that's the structure that is kind of hidden by in the data, right? That's the structure that the algorithm needs to find out. And that's a, a very powerful uh, note. Sorry, Juan. Yes? Yeah, I will take you back a bit. Um, so there's a question. Can you relate the effect of dimensionality to the previous equation? I think one of the equations you presented earlier. Uh, so in the equations I presented are completely uh, dimension free, right? So like all the decomposition of error that I introduced really has no, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very general principle. And, and now the question about dimensionality is how do all these particular terms that we have identified, how do they behave, behave as a function of the dimensionality of the input? Right, but this decomposition of error that we introduced is something that uh, that is completely um, uh, completely agnostic to dimension. There's one one, uh, and maybe the question was in that direction. That maybe something I forgot to, to mention that is actually important is that if you look at if we look at this decomposition of error, there's one hyperparameter, like a one key hyperparameter, which is delta. Right, the learner can choose delta. And maybe the question was in that direction is, is how does the how does delta depend on dimension? That's actually a, an, a very important point. And many of the analyses that uh, we are not going to cover in this lecture, but many, many of the if you are interested in more like this uh, statistical analysis and more the theory, indeed, delta is something that is typically op being optimized with respect to dimension. And it depends on the dimension, but it also depends on, on finer properties of the functional class. Uh, so if someone is interested in knowing more, uh, please maybe we can we can connect on that offline, and I'll give you some references. Okay, so I was here, and uh, and so um, yeah, so I was as I was saying that the, this principle of learning is really based on a, a very fundamental property that we are able to extract structure, like to find structure based on the proximity between the training and the test. Right, so like when we see things that are somehow similar, somehow close, it's very it's very tempting for us to just uh, you know um, uh, propagate the information that we observe to the propagation from nearest from from neighbors. The problem, of course, is that the notion of similarity, um, this principle of learning by basically finding patterns and finding things that are similar, is something is a it's a principle that suffers quite a lot in high dimension. And so, and, and we are gonna um, try to, I, I will try to give you like a very, like a hint of why this problem becomes complicated by just focusing on what we call Lipschitz functions. So uh, I don't know if it's easy to call people, but 
I mean, are people familiar with the lips? What does the elliptic property mean? Uh, maybe I can just get like a. Okay, someone is writing on the chat. Let me just let me read it. Yes. Perfect. Yes, I see. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, I see a lot of yes. That's good. Great. So Lipschitz function. So why do so Lipschitz function encapsulates the notion of locality, right? It's a it's a hypothesis on a function that is just basically it's like the the elementary fundamental regularity that only depends on locality in the sense that it, it tells me that the value of the function at one point uh, is not going to be far from the value of the function at the point that is made right so if x and x prime are small then f of x and f, f x prime are close to that. okay so it's really like that if you want to understand the, the role of locality in learning that's the function that you need to understand right that's the good source of inspiration and so now here's my question for you. I tell you, I, I promise you that the, uh, you know, the data is generated by a function f star. And the only thing I tell you is that this function is valid, nothing else. And the data distribution, let's say that I make it things quite simple, is gonna be like Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distribution with a like standard covariance. So just as a, as a rule of thumb, how many samples do you think you need to be able to estimate the target f star up to error epsilon? So any guesses? Do you think that you need, I don't know, d sample, d squared, d to the 10, d to the seven? Uh, how many samples do you think you need? And I don't know if some answers there. Yes, exponential d, good. Okay, someone already uh, uh, knows the answer. Indeed. The, 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 the thing here, the, this question here, really smells that you will need to have many, many samples. And somehow these samples need, will scale badly with them, right? That's, that's why we are talking about the cause of dimensionality. And so, and, and just to try to, I mean, I, I was planning to just uh, uh, go with you with a little uh, derivation. I don't know if there's, uh, how am I doing in time? Okay, I'm doing relatively well, so maybe I can just start. I will try to sketch uh, some arguments. And then perhaps if people are interested, uh, you know, you want to work out the details, and we can uh, uh, see them, you know, in the following lectures. So, uh, how can we first, uh, indeed, uh, verify that with enough samples we are going to be able to learn? Right. So remember, like the setup is that here we have a bunch of samples that come from our target. Okay, and assume that they have n samples. And so uh, let's first describe an upper bound, right? So let's first invent an algorithm, an estimator, and see that this estimator is going to do well, given that provided that then is, is large uh, as we expect. So what, what, is the, what is our choice of estimator? So first, let me just uh, uh, introduce the notation. So here, remember that this our hypothesis space is going to be all the functions that are going from Rd to R. And I'm, let, let, just, let me just assume that F is going to be bounded because the data is bounded, so why not? And then F is going to be Lipschitz. And in fact, one can show that this space that I introduced is in fact a Banach space. Okay, so this is means that in this is means that it has a norm, right? So it's norm. So it means that it has a notion of complexity that comes quite naturally for free. And what do you think is the notion of complexity that we can choose to organize functions in that hypothesis space? A very natural notion is the Lipschitz constant, right? If a function has very small Lipschitz constant, it's simpler than a function that has very large Lipschitz constant, right? Because it oscillates less, right? So so now we can define our estimator. We are going to use this ERM in the, let's say, in the interval language. In the interpolant form. All right. So remember what is the interpolant form. So we are going to define f hat, that is the art min, so f in f. Of the Lipschitz constant, such that we go through the points, all the points, right? So that f of xi is equal to f star of xi 
for a while. Okay. So, how do we compute the error between this estimator and the ground truth? Right, so now let's pick um, uh, x that is drawn from the distribution. And we want to compute f of x minus f star of x. And so remember again, I, I told you that there's basically one trick to compute bounds in machine learning. So here we need to introduce the same trick again. And it might be helpful to uh, draw little points, right? So we have, this is the, let's say that this is your space. And these are the points that you have drawn, right? So these are the size. And that's the point that I'm just drawing here. X is gonna be somewhere here. Okay, so what is the what is the what is the correct way to add and subtract? So we can call it this add and subtract trick. So we are going to consider the point uh, that is closest from the point cloud to x, right? So let's call this point. Let's call it i of i here, x i here, right? This what this is one of our samples. So we are going to add it and subtract it. So what do we get? we get that this is smaller than f hat of x minus f hat of x of i zero. We also add the difference between f of i zero minus f star of f of y zero plus f star of x of y zero minus f star of x. Okay, so we have added and subtracted as other and added and subtracted both f hat of at that point and f star at that point. Okay, so now what can you tell me about this three term? Someone has an idea on how to bound these terms? We can start from the one in the middle, the one in the middle. What do you think? How much is this term? Okay, maybe someone wrote in the chat. Sorry, I'm not looking in the chat. No. So the term in the middle is going to cost zero, right? Why? Why is this term zero? It's zero because this point. I pick it from the training set, right? And by definition, I know that my interpolant passes to all the points, right? So this term by construction, this is zero. And what about the third term? F star between x, y, zero and x. Now I have to use the hypothesis. F star is Lipschitz, yes? And F hat is also Lipschitz because I choose it to minimize the Lipschitz constant. And in particular, it's not only Lipschitz, but the Lipschitz constant of f star, sorry, of f hat is at most the one of f star, because f star is an interpolant. Right? So this in fact is just two times the distance between x uh, x i zero minus x. Okay, so now we basically we we are basically done because now uh, what we can uh, obtain, and again uh, I might need to have the next. Uh, Page. I don't know how to do that. Um, okay, let me just um, continue here. Um, doesn't matter. Now, what we have is that the expectation with respect to x of um, f of x minus f star of x. This is just upper bounded by four. And here I just choose the, the Lipschitz constant to be one, so just four times the expectation over x of x minus x i two, right? And this is the, this is defined by definition as the closest point from the point side. So uh, for those who are familiar, and I, I believe that maybe this um, this is something that might not be directly um, uh, uh, obvious to you. 
this this object this quantity here is actually a well known quantity right you have a, i have a data distribution right i have a sample of n points and i'm asking the question now i draw a new point and i look at the at the smallest distance that i need to travel from this new point to one of the points on the sample so this is actually a bonus question i mean if someone knows what this term is about that's going to be awesome. Uh, so this actually is a is a is a quantity that is a kind of very fashionable these days in machine learning. It's called the fastest time distance, right? This is the transport distance. So this is the, the square of a certain distance between the Gaussian distribution and its empirical version of n points. And so, uh, unfortunately, we know that this distance. Uh, actually, this distance is well studied. How it became, right? how it how it depends on the dimension and n. And in fact, this distance is actually of the order of n to the minus one over d. Okay, so of course, if you want to make this thing equal to epsilon, right? That's our target. You see that the epsilon needs to be exponential in dimension, right? So this implies that epsilon needs to be, um, sorry, n needs to be epsilon to the minus two, right? Which is unfortunately what we need to do. For the lower bound, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna break uh, here with you, but I really encourage you to to think about um, how to establish that this number of samples is not only uh, sufficient, but it's also necessary, right? In the sense that one cannot learn with less number of samples than exponential in the um, I'll So for the lower bound. Okay. And if someone is interested, I will be happy to follow up on country part. OK. Uh, so now let's, uh, so this was actually a, a curse of dimensionality that emerges in the in more it has more like a statistical flavor right that was like identifying a function from two samples in fact this curse of dimensionality appears in many 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 other contexts right and so uh, it can also appear in just a pure approximation and just to illustrate uh why the curse is everywhere i want to focus on for now just a second in the model that concerns only a, it's, a, it's a model of neural networks where there's only one hidden layer and this is, these are the functions, the function class of the function that I can write as a linear combination of activation functions, right? They're of simple activation. That's the architecture that you see here. And so this class, this hypothesis class, has a very natural notion of complexity. That is how many neurons I have, right? So like the, the width of the, of the hidden layer acts as a very natural notion of complexity. So um, what we know, uh, and maybe you have heard, is that there is a, like a, you know, this class is interesting because it comes with this like a seemingly powerful positive result, namely that I can use this class to approximate anything I want. Because uh, if, I, if I consider an activation function here that is not a polynomial, then I can approximate any continuous function uh, arbitrarily well, uni uniformly over any compound. Okay, that's very good. But the, the real question here is what is the rate of approximation, right? So as I said before, we, we are interested in uh, approximation errors that work at finite delta, right? So we wanna control the complexity, right? We remember that we wanted to look at the difference between uh, approximation over the full hypothesis space minus approximation over a subset of the hypothesis space that has small complexity, right? So here is really, it really contains a question of how can we approximate functions with a small number of neurons. So unfortunately, uh, these rates of approximation, again, are cursed. Uh, and they're cursed, and of course, this depends on, on many things. But so if we took, for example, a, a very simple class of functions that contain uh, what's called solid functions. So these are functions that are, uh, that are square integral and that have S derivatives that are square integral. Right, so if a function has, let's say, ten derivatives, it would belong to this H with S equal ten. So what we know is that if I look, if I try to approximate 
a function in, in a solar left phase with a neural network, cell neural network, I'm going to, indeed, this error is going to go to zero when m goes to infinity, but it's going to go to zero extremely slowly. Right? It's going to go to zero at the rate that is minus s over d. So unless s is of the order of dimension, right? So, so if, if this uh, uh, fraction here is, unless, unless s is of the order of d, this is going to be very, very, very slow convergence. Right. In other words, I will need I will need an exponential number of neurons to approximate this function at at, at first try precision. So this is very not this is not very very useful. So there's a, a, a nice uh, um, alternative that was introduced by Andrew Barron in, in the 90s that you might have heard is that okay you can what if we restrict the class of target function right instead of us trying to approximate any function that is in that class right? How about we look for for a smaller simpler set of functions? Of course, if you make the simple set of functions, if you make your target space to be smaller, simpler, you're going to be able to approximate it better, right? Because uh, I mean, it's almost like a tautology, right? If I try to only learn a function that is constant, I will be able to learn a function that is constant, right? Because I make my hypothesis space very small. So here we have a, we can indeed Baron show this very nice result that if my function is what's called in the Baron class, which is a set of functions that are Lipschitz and they have a certain property very fast decay of the Fourier transform, right? The, 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 the norm of the, and this is really like an L1 norm of the Fourier transform. If the L1 norm of the Fourier transform is bounded, then we can approximate them well uh, in, in the shallow, in this uh, uh, space of neural networks with a number of neurons that does not uh, depend on dimension, right? So here the rate of approximation is dimension four. That's good. But the downside here, again, is that the, the, these, these uh, benefits here they come at the expense of making a very strong assumption, right? And we are going to hopefully see more of this during this uh, lecture series. There's another curse that appears that, that, that is uh, also uh, pervasive here in our problem. That is the curse of, of dimensionality in optimization. So as you know, uh, if I give you this function, let's say that I give you this landscape on the right-hand side, and I ask you to find the global minimum, what do you do? Well, I mean, a priori, you have no other choice than to just visit every possible point and just uh, remember where is the lo where, where was the smallest location, right? So in other words, you need to grid the space and 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 just uh, evaluate every possible point and just find the smallest. Of course, this has exponential dependency in dimension, and it's again the same story, right? If you have a space of hypotheses or a space of like domains or parameters that you need exponential number of balls to cover it, something you're going to take, right? You're going to, there's an exponential blow up uh, of complexity. So how do we in practice overcome this curse in optimization? So luckily, many problems in machine learning, the landscape doesn't look like this. It's more like a nice landscape, you know, from a nice uh, summer vacation. At least that's how we imagine it. It might be like non-convex, right? You might still have things here that are, you know, possibly rugged. But you know, water, when it rains, there's water that falls everywhere. And water, some, most of the time, finds its way to the sea. Right? So it means that there's always a descent path that somehow brings the water to the ground state. Right? So in other words, I mean, these in more mathematical terms, many of the landscapes that we hear about, they don't have many, many bad local minima. Right? So in other words, the, 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 the places where I'm going to be stuck in the landscape they're not very, not very large, right? It's not like in the worst case of where I have an exponential number. And so this, in a sense, reduces the problem. If, if we can reduce to understanding how expensive it is to find a local minimum on a function, right? Instead of finding a global minimum that we know in the worst case is exponential, how about finding a, a local minimum? So do you think that finding a local minimum function is, is it complicated, is it hard, or is it easy in high dimension? What do you think? Okay, answer. Easy. Okay. Yes. Obviously, it should be easier than finding a global, right? So quantitatively, indeed, we can quantify, right? So, so gradient descent, in fact, can find local minima efficiently. And what do we mean efficiently here? Again, we state it in terms of like iteration complexity, right? So we, if we want to find a point that is an approximate second order stationary point. That's the terminology for local minima. Uh, 
that has error epsilon, you know, like a, like epsilon approximate stationary state of all the points. We need the number of iterations that is of the order of one over epsilon squared. And here, these uh, these uh, notations here, this O tilde, uh, it means that it's hiding log factors, right? So there's things that might depend on dimension, but only logarithmically. What it means is that the number, if we want to, if we want to find a second order stationary point up to some error epsilon, we can run it for number of iterations that is of the order of one over epsilon squared. And the dimension can be a million, a billion, a trillion. This doesn't change, which means that this algorithm, that's why, in fact, it's so uh, pervasive and so you know, versatile in high dimensions because of this problem. Of course, uh, this is with a big, big if, right? Is that the, in the case where uh, you know, this, this situation, right? That I spilled before, I mean, that's not true all the time, right? I mean, uh, uh, there's, there's still many, many problems in machine learning where the assumption that there's no bad local minima is not true. And so, but in fact, but, but in a sense, provided that the RM has no bad local minima, uh, we have no depend, no dependence, no dimension dependence in finding local minima. It's in a sense like a, a pretty good, good news for, for the optimization side of things. So the summary so far, uh, and it's almost the end of the lecture, is that uh, if we look at the Lipschitz class of functions, this is this class is too long. Right, we are we are cursed by statistic like the statistical error is cursed by dimension, and and you can visualize this by imagining how many of these functions like I can I can consider like a heat map in a dimension in a sphere of dimension d, and as long as the you know like the trying to identify a heat map, there's no other way than just trying to uh, evaluate this heat map at all the points, right? If I unless I grid the space, I cannot learn this function. If I try to make assumptions, stronger assumptions about the regularity, for example, I can ask for more smoothness, right? I can ask more derivative to be to be uh, to be finite, or I can ask this barren condition. This indeed breaks the course of dimensionality, but we lose a lot, right? It's like a, okay, we you know trying to make the, the thing easier and easier and easier. At the end, you just destroy the beauty of the problem, right? Just becomes it just becomes a problem that is a bit, a bit boring, right? And there's not so many things that you can approximate with such strong smoothness. So the, really like the point is that we need to basically break this paradigm, right? We need to think about function spaces a little bit out of the box. And so how to do that? And so the, the, the key observation, right? And, and this is really by no means a, you know, like a revelatory thing. I mean, that has been observed by many engineers before the theorists is to understand, yeah, that the, the, the data that we are looking for in practice, right? This is like the, we, we, so I tried to, I gave you at the beginning uh, an illustration where the data were points in a high dimensional space, right? Every point was an input. But in fact, every point here, you know, it's not just a point in a high dimensional space. In fact, every point itself is a signal, right? So when we look at a, a point here, like a horse, right? Or like anything that you visualize itself is a function, right? So like the, the in a sense, this high dimensional space X is hiding inside itself, a low dimensional structure. Right? And this low dimensional structure can be, as here I illustrated, in like a grid that is in 2D, or as you will see later in the, in the lecture series, this low dimensional structure can be a group, for example, like a sphere, can be a, a graph, can be a geometric object, like a, a, a mesh, etc. Right? And so the, the key question here right, is that the, can we now exploit this geometric domain to find new notions of regularity? That we can use to kind of overcome these these uh, limitations that I just showed you on classical space just functions. So, so just as a takeaway, and and this is this this is the last slide. Uh, what I what we pro, what we talked about in this first lecture is that high dimensional learning is an impossible problem, right? Unless we have assumptions, and the course of dimensionality is a is a you know beautiful yet pervasive effect that makes this choice complicated, right? In particular, guaranteeing that we can have a simultaneous handle on all the three sources of error, that's to some extent still like a pretty much an open question. Uh, what we see for sure is that these classical notions of regularity do not work. So if we make the slip sheet assumptions, that's not sufficient. If we make very strong smooth assumption from solve the left classes, that's too strong. So, uh, because uh, by trying to realize by realizing that the inputs in many of the problems in machine learning are not just points in high dimensional space, 
but signals that the fire of a low dimensional manifold uh, domains, we are gonna see in the next lectures how this geometric structure can be used to define new hypothesis spaces, for example, using invariance, or using synthesis, and using scale. So we are gonna see these in the next lecture. And so with that, I'll, I'll thank you very much. And I believe I need to stop the recording now so that people can ask questions.